Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. Ain't gonna hurt. Is my boomstick. Game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Bargain Bin. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandra Luketic. And today we're talking 1981's The Howling. We assume that if you're listening to this episode, you have already seen the movie. And I have seen this movie a lot. I have not. <laughs> but I figured as much. And I have very fond memories of the movie, and that's why I really wanted to bring it up. I wanted you to see it. Because 1981 was a really big year for uh, for werewolf films. Because I believe An American Werewolf in London also came out this year. Um, and I never really cared for that movie that much. But thinking about it while doing these notes, um, I think they complement each other really well because what one film lacks, the other one has in spades. So, I don't know, it could be a really good uh, double feature for some people. Yeah, maybe I should watch the other one someday. Yeah, um, I might force myself to do that. <laughs> I don't like the way you said that. <laughs> Oh, it's now just I'm, a really, really campy film. Now I'm with super some excited. Great oh, I can't wait. After that reaction, I'm hoping we get to do it. Uh, okay, uh, I will take that as a request. No, <laughs> that's not a request. <laughs> forego next week's episode. We'll push that one back, and it's an American Wolf. No, mind. no, no. We can't forego next week's episode. To next pull week's featured episode. with an American Werewolf in Paris. Even next worse. week's episode is the fan pick. We can't do that. I know. Anyway, anyway, let's get into this movie because I'm not okay. I'm not going to start getting focused on some other werewolf movie when I have another one right in front of me. Perfect. This is what like our fifth werewolf film. Anyway, that's something like we that. open oh, maybe we open on a television interview with Dr. George Wagner, played by Patrick Macney. Macney? Macney? I don't know. Whatever. He's recognizable. Uh, talking about how repression is the father of psychosis and how we shouldn't deny the animal within ourselves. It's a dangerous thing to say on national television. I, it's uh, 1981, we, man. They can say that's true. They can say things a little bit more freely than they can say these days, and I, I think we're gonna see that very soon. Yeah, uh, even the shit they show on like network TV. I'm watching season one of Miami Vice right now, and the shit they get away with then is crazy. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Cut to television news anchor Karen White walking down an alley. She's on a mission to meet an obsessed fan and potential serial killer named Eddie. And this whole thing is actually just a sting operation. Uh, the police are using her as bait. Which seems really fucking dangerous. Yeah, for an untrained news reporter to be the bait? Well, and she's like, already confronted by a guy who's, like, asking her how much. Which, There's no police around. We talked about this, and... I mean, you tried to tell me that this made sense, but, like, why did he think she was a prostitute? Area of town, probably. And he's a piece of shit. But she's dressed like a mom. Okay. <laughs> it's, not like she was even, it's not like she was sent to the sting operation wearing a miniskirt or something. But like, Yeah, but you're also assuming the guy's rational. I mean, he seemed pretty t together with it, I guess. He it wasn't look like he tweaking out or anything, but... It looked like a piece of shit leaning up against a brick wall by himself in an alleyway. Is it because he that's had a not, beard? Not put is that, together. Is that why? <sighs> so does he had a beard? I, I don't know if he did actually. Just gonna... Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she enters a phone booth marked by a smiley face sticker and is blocked in by a man standing in front of the door. Oh. Karen is worried that this is the killer. But just then the phone rings and it's Eddie. A little rude if that's just a guy waiting for the phone booth to be leaning on it. It, Yeah, it is. It really is. Give her a little bit of space here, buddy. Personal space didn't exist in the 80s, man. Oh, apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the police lose their radio contact with Karen just as she's made plans to meet Eddie at an unknown location. Uh, it also turns out that the invading personal space guy outside the phone booth is just Roger Corman, film producer and director. <laughs> Not a cameo. That's just really Roger Corman playing. Yeah, he his doesn't he's, he's trying to <laughs> he's trying to call somebody. Get me out of this thing. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> he actually just wandered onto set thinking it was actually a city street. <laughs> well, I've been looking for a payphone for hours. <laughs> Uh, the police panic, not knowing where Karen is going. She enters a porn shop, oblivious to the fact that the comm link has been lost, and she's on her own. And this, which is, is where actually it, really cool tension. It's cool tension, but it also highlights what you just said. Like you're sending in an untrained news anchor as your bait, and her only lifeline was that comm. Yeah, it feels like you're missing a couple of fail safes there. Oh, here's a failsafe for you. When you take the phone call, you tell him where to meet her. Bam, police are there already. Yeah, I don't think I get the impression that he would have complied, though. Probably not, you're right. Yeah. He could have tried, though. That's true. She walks through a bearded, a bearded curtain? A beaded curtain. Now you got me thinking about the guy in the alley again. Did, he, have a, the did he actually have a beard or not? Did I make that I up? Don't, I don't know. I don't <laughs> think it, it matters. <laughs> How long was his scruff? <laughs> that would explain a lot. Uh, maybe it was foreshadowing. He was a werewolf. If that, okay, that would have been great. That would have been great if that was Eddie. Anyway. Okay. She walks through the beaded curtain and into the back of the store to a line of notorious porn booths. Spotting another smiley face sticker on one of the doors, she enters. I really liked uh, identifying where to go by placing the smiley face stickers around. Well, yeah, because to anybody walking around just looks like, you know, somebody defaced the property with a sticker. Once in the dark booth, a film plays portraying the rape of a teenager. Karen states her presence to Eddie, who is now standing in the booth behind her. He puts his hands on her shoulders and forces her to watch the film. So this part really creeped me out. Um, yeah, me too. Because not the fact that he recorded a video of this woman getting raped, although that's creepy, obviously, but the fact that he somehow got it projecting in the porn booth without anybody that works there or owns it noticing. Because if I'm not mistaken, you can pick what plays there, but you don't control it. Like, you don't put in your own home videos. Um, I think that was the movie in the booth. Oh. You didn't. You didn't get to pick. You just you pick the booth, and whatever's in the booth is what you end up watching. I don't know this from experience. I just realized how bad that sounded. But uh, yeah, no, you just go in and put your money in, and you see what you see. See, I thought that this was something that Bill was involved in in the recording. Eddie, you mean Eddie? Yes, I keep... <laughs> Bill was in. <laughs> 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 and he's actually just the guy being like, look, your husband's cheating on you. <laughs> and not just cheating on you. He's cheating on you with women that are not willing. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I don't think that's cheating. Well, yeah, but I mean, forcefully. I meant Eddie. I thought this video was like Eddie had recorded himself participating in these acts. I could see why you would think that, but no, it's... it's it's disturbing either way. It's very disturbing what's on screen, but, uh, so that yeah. just means that that's the kind of movie that's playing in that booth, which makes it creepy in another way that people are going to watch that. I, you know what? It's really fucked up. Let's just move on. Cause first I feel uncomfortable and I made myself sound stupid. So let's just, let's just move forward <laughs> in the booth. Eddie tells Karen that every girl in the city is dead, not like her, and he's going to light up her whole body, which is a really creepy statement. His breathing intensifies, then instructs her to turn around, and though it's difficult to see the man backlit by the film projector, Karen is horrified. Very effective filmmaking. I'm going to assume that's because he was at least partially transformed? Uh, I don't know, because he's just a creepy looking dude anyway. True. Uh, the police are now in the store, and the clerk tells them that the broad is in the booth. Because, uh, they because Sorry. only one woman has ever gone in there, or at least that day? Oh, basically. You saw when she walked in, the the guy working is like, what the fuck? <laughs> even, even the other men, like the patrons of the store, see her and like quickly shove magazines and books back into the shelves and just leave. Well, yeah, because she looks like their mother. 
I think it's because it's a woman. I get it, but yeah, and they don't want to be seen there. Well, yeah, they're embarrassed. Speaking of embarrassing, that would be the police coming up here because they run to the back when they hear her scream and open fire on the booth, missing Karen, but shooting Eddie repeatedly through the door. And I have no idea how they didn't kill both of them. Yeah. (laughs) It's not like they could see who they were shooting at. Nothing. They couldn't see anything. They just open fire and then you see blood come from under the door into the hallway. It seems about right, right? Like that's police tactics. I guess. Police in the 80s. Or now. (laughs) Or now, I guess, yeah. (laughs) Not the realism in this film. As her now present husband Bill escorts her away from the scene, we overhear an officer saying that Eddie was unarmed. And that's a huge trouble for police reports, which never comes up again in the story. Uh, I would have loved to drop a line somewhere where they're like, they almost fired like eight police officers. It, It also could be a little bit of foreshadowing. How so? Uh, isn't it? No, no, never mind. Okay. I, I'm just... later in the movie, somebody gets unarmed. Okay. All right. I get you. Uh, journalist Chris, played by Dennis Dugan, questions Karen about the events, but she's in a state of shock and has no memory of what just happened. Yeah. Police just opened fire on her. <laughs> yeah. Also... Why is there a journalist there? Like, you think the police would keep everybody back until they know exactly what's going on. Well, he had just finished putting some books and movies back on a shelf and scurrying out the door. <laughs> <laughs> he stuck like around. The, the perfect cover. <laughs> I'm a journalist. He stuck around because he's like, this might be newsworthy. <laughs> yeah, I was just uh, passing by. Uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> Cops like, yeah, you just passed me by, going the other direction in a hurried manner. So what uh, what traumatized Karen here? Was it Eddie or was it the cops shooting? Uh, I'd say first off, it would be going to meet a potential serial killer in a porn store, followed up with being forced to watch that movie, then turning around and seeing this monster in the booth behind you, then being shot at repeatedly. And then just being put outside on the back of a car. And see, and that's why I think that Eddie must have been transformed. Because the other things absolutely would contribute. But I feel like seeing a werewolf on top of all of that would definitely push... Spoilers! Like, we don't know Eddie is a villain? (laughs) Um, I don't... uh, He definitely wasn't fully transformed. Well, that's why I said, even when I asked, was he partially transformed? Are we to believe uh, it, this, right? Like, it or could showing. Be. Right? Because, I mean, even still, like, if he wasn't armed, which they clearly indicate that he wasn't, uh, would it just being a creepy looking dude that they know is a serial killer be enough to traumatize her? Right? It might well, make... knowing that he's obsessed with her, too. Well, like I said, I mean, that might. Well, she knew he was obsessed with him before she went in there. Um, Yeah, but she's face-to-face with him now, and we don't know what mental state she's in normally, let alone being thrust into a police thing. Like, I'm sure she didn't exactly get training for that. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think the shooting might have been more involved in the traumatization than they want to let on. I'm blaming the cops here. I don't know if the shooting was a major part, because she was fine. I guess she didn't we're not get hit at all. Right. I guess not. Yeah. Let's see. Where was I? Uh, you're being interrupted by me, apparently. <laughs> I don't know if I covered this or not, but it's a good spot to get back into it. Back at their house, Karen has the first in what will become a string of nightmares. We return to journalist Chris, worried porn patron, and uh, partner Terry. Uh, they discover where Eddie was living and snoop through his apartment. The walls are covered with Eddie's artwork of monstrous beings and also newspaper clippings detailing murders around the city. Among the artwork, they discover a charcoal sketch of Karen as well as a seaside landscape. And I don't know about you, but they focused on that seaside landscape long enough for me to know that that was going to be the setting for the rest of the movie. The first time I saw this, I knew that that's where we were going. And when did you see it the first time? How old were you, do you think? Uh, I probably saw it in like 89, so like... Eight years old? Seven, 
Seven, eight? Yeah. Seven, eight, and you could already tell. <laughs> I've watched a lot of movies in my life. Well, they didn't hide it very well, obviously. No. Um, they take the artwork to Dr. Wagner to analyze. And let's see. Karen stops an intimate moment with Bill because of the flashback she's having. And Bill acts like a complete asshole rolling over and going to sleep. I mean, read the room, Bill. <laughs> like, she was just traumatized in a, we don't know, werewolf, no, but a serial killer <laughs> police shooting confrontation. You think she's got her engine revving at this point? Come on, man. Bill is one of the most awkward characters in this movie. Yeah. And I, I think it's intentional because every time we see him, he looks uncomfortable and out of place and acts as if that's true. And as we see him throughout the movie, he kind of becomes more and more comfortable. Okay. Yeah, I know this movie actually has a little bit of character development. Uh, it has character development. The question is if it's good. Yeah, true. Uh, the station manager decides to put Karen on TV too early, and she freezes when they go live, obviously. I'm not entirely sure what they thought was going to happen. I mean, she... I, I feel like they don't really say how long it's been, but I feel like it's only been a few days. Yeah, I, I get that feeling too, like two, three days. Um, yeah, because it feels like they're forcing her to go on, and she's she's she doesn't want to, but she's just going with the flow on this one. Yeah, and it makes me wonder who sent her on this sting operation. Was it the police or the radio station or the television station? That's a good question. I'm sure they. I'm sure they tipped the police off to it and tried to make a story out of it. Yeah, because like it's not like they're not privy to the information of what took place. Yeah, and when they have to like cut the live feed, the station manager throws on an editorial that he did himself and says something along the lines of, now that's a real journalist right there. Yep. So yeah, I think I think the idea that the, the TV station, or the, at least the station manager, definitely had some sort of say to get this uh, sting operation on the go, or at least alert the police to what's going on. Fair. For personal gain. Yeah. So he shouldn't be so oblivious to what she's gone through, is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's more of like he thinks he knows what's right and she froze, so it's her fault. <laughs> Jack, I guess. Yeah. I guess, yeah. Well, she goes to Dr. Wagner to try to regain her memory. Um, he recommends that she goes to the colony for the week. It's a special getaway that he only recommends to special patients. Uh, an experiment with group trauma or grouping traumatized people in serene surroundings to help the healing process. Seems creepy to me, man. It really did, right? At first I'm like, oh, that sounds kind of nice. And then I thought about it, I'm like, that could be a potential nightmare in and of itself. Yeah, I guess it must be another one of those 80s things. But if if my therapist said to me, yeah, you should probably go away for this weekend retreat, I'd be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm good at home, yeah, feeling safe. Yeah. Why don't we just do the task that you are assigned to do right here? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, without it, the, the story doesn't exist, though, so I get it. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how much of this is different than the uh, the novel that it's based off of. I didn't even know it was based on a novel. Yeah, uh, I completely forgot about that, and I'd definitely love to check it out at some point, try and track that down. Okay, cool. Uh, well, we cut to Earl played by the amazing John Carradine, uh, father of David Keith and Robert Carradine, uh, on a beach at night yowling at the moon. Now, I felt really bad because when we watched this together, I thought that was Crazy Ralph from the Friday the 13th movies. And they do look similar, but then I felt really bad because John Carradine had an amazing film career, and I completely thought he was just somebody different. But anyway. I forgive just, you. Thank you. That means the world to me. <laughs> I mean, it, it looked like you were... It, it sounded like you felt bad for a comment that I didn't even remember happening. <laughs> I know. I had to address things. Also, I'm going to address this right now. I also feel really bad because I, during our Ninja Turtles episode, I called them amphibians. They're reptiles. Didn't you already apologize for that? 
Probably, but it still weighs on me. Let me be. Let it go, dude. <laughs> Just let it go. Well, this is just a group beach party and cookout at the colony. Karen and Bill meet married couple Jerry and Donna, other patients of Dr. Wagner. Jerry offers Bill some of his barbecue, but we learn that Bill is a vegetarian because of course he is. Again, fish out of water, Bill. Next, they meet Noble Willingham, uh, played by jolly old Charlie Barton, who is as country as country can be. And I think that's a character that they really needed in this film because everybody is so serious rightfully so based off of what we've seen but his over-the-top personality and humor i think really lightens the tone to get us into the colony i thought it was a really smart move sure well it's time for a beach hoedown earl sits off to the side stating he can't go on like this anymore they're not doing much to try and hide what's going on in this movie I remember thinking that it was more of like a, a mystery, like, is it or isn't it a werewolf thing? Is there only one werewolf? Are there more? What's going on? But Earl just kind of blurts it out. <laughs> Bill encounters nymphomaniac Marsha, played by Elizabeth Brooks, and says he's looking for his wife. Her answer? Why? Bill quickly excuses himself. She knows Dr. what she Wagner wants. Yeah, she knows what she wants. I don't know why Wagner would... Actually, wait, yeah, I do. I know why he would want her at the uh, colony, because of reasons we find out later. Or reasons that Earl just blurt out again later. (laughs) Dr. Wagner walks with Karen, explaining why he thought time in the country and being away from television is best for her. Marsha returns a book to Wagner, saying he should keep it to himself. She doesn't want her brother TC, another patient, reading it, because Wagner has already done enough damage. Uh, now that's a backstory that we don't get that I would be really interested in seeing. Mm-hmm. Cause I find TC, her brother wearing his weird furry vest is probably one of the creepier characters in the movie. And we really don't see a whole lot of them. Nope. He's just there for a few shots of awkwardness and then maybe a Light little bit story of progression. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I don't know if at this point, I guess you're supposed to not know who might be a werewolf and, They're kind of using him as a bit of a red herring. Yeah. Depressed, Earl wanders the beach and decides the best way to end things is to throw himself into the bonfire. The other residents hold him back and try to calm him down. There's truth to his woes, but the other residents tell Karen and Bill that Earl acts up a lot and sometimes drinks too much. Which is a pretty eager way to explain away the whole situation, I would think. I mean... Yeah, that's just Earl. Sometimes he gets drunk and jumps in a fire. I mean, if if he's a, as we're to believe, patient at this mental facility, and they know he has a drinking problem, maybe letting him drink at a beach hoedown is not a good idea. Yeah, really. Let's get this crazy, old, drunken, traumatized man around other trauma patients and just see how that goes. That's an experiment, Wagner. Yeah. That night, Karen has more nightmares of Eddie, then Earl screaming into the fire and wakes to a howling in the woods. She tries to wake Bill, but he's dead to the world. She leans out the window and into the night, and hears multiple howls from within the woods. Bill finally wakes up and tells her it's just a dog, and go back to bed. Keep being that supportive husband, Bill. Oh man, he is a jerk. (laughs) Yeah. But it's weird because earlier in the movie, it seems like he is spineless, and now he's just being like a bully asshole. I guess he's only a bully to women. Yeah, yeah, basically he is. That's a, that's 100% right. Fuck you, Bill. Mm. Karen decides to build a fire in the fireplace, a good place to do so, but we get a shaky POV shot of something approaching their cabin. She hears a noise and does the smart thing of just going outside, where she finds a scrap of clothing on a tree branch. Horror Once inside, movie. we get a reveal of Marsha's brother watching Karen from the woods. Horror movie 101. If you hear a noise, go towards it. But we already know that she's afraid. So why would she just walk outside? <laughs> oh, it's because Bill said it was just a dog. Yeah, she's not afraid of dogs. No. I told you before we started recording, the more I go through these notes, the more my opinion changes on this film. I'll leave it there for now. Okay. The next morning, Karen and Donna are playing tennis when Sheriff Sam Newfield, played by Slim Pickens, arrives to question them about a coyote problem the area is having 
providing a quick explanation to Karen's worries the previous night. Not a coyote problem. Wasn't it a coyote problem? Oh, a coyote problem. Oh, that's like nails on a chalkboard. Heard y'all yeah. got a problem with coyotes? Uh... Well, we have, we have coyotes here, and I have never heard them howl. I hear them whine and, like, chitter about, which is, like, it's still creepy, but I've never heard them howl like wolves. Yeah? Do you call them coyotes? A lot of people here do, yeah. <sighs> I know. I know. I just bite my tongue. Okay. Cut to Chris and Terry at the coroner's office. They've arrived to check on Eddie Quist's body. The coroner opens the cold chamber to reveal a shredded body bag and claw marks on the inside of the cold chamber door. The belief being that the body was stolen. Um, okay. Problems here. Do you, do you have anything that kind of jumps out at you? Nope. How would nobody notice a body being stolen? How would nobody notice a, a drawer for a body opening from the inside? I, I, I'll give them the fact that there may be no cameras at this point. But I do know for a fact that bodies are signed in and out. So there's no written record. Nobody saw this happen whatsoever. Nobody heard anything happen. I just... I Okay, if Eddie came back to life, clawed his way out, he looks fucked up in the first place. So even if he wandered through the medical facility and out the front door, somebody would have had to see him and be like, I don't think he belongs here. Yeah. All right. That night, Donna and Karen hear what they think are Charlie's cows being attacked. They grab a flashlight and a gun and go investigate. They discover a mutilated cow in a field just before the running into Charlie and Sam. <sighs> I, I have to laugh at this part. Who are also out in the field stating that they thought there was a cowjacker out there. Two things. I didn't realize stealing cows was an issue in a rural community. And also, cowjacker is a horrible term. <laughs> Sam confirms Karen's fear that a coyote couldn't have done that much damage. Yeah, he messed up that cow. Yeah. Yeah, that cow is uh, maybe a pretty shredded. Pack of coyotes? Uh, maybe? Do coyotes hunt in packs? I don't think so. Yeah. The next I've... day, Bill and the other men from the colony are out wolf hunting. Karen arrives and tells Bill she doesn't want him out there hunting. But the men react poorly, and Bill convinces her it's a good bonding situation, and Karen leaves an agreement. Okay. It's a so quick 180 there. So Bill is a vegetarian, yep. but apparently it's not because of harming animals, since he has no problem prior to being transformed or anything going hunting. Yep. So I guess he's just a vegetarian because he doesn't like the taste of meat. Um... I think he was out there hunting because there's a wolf killing livestock. And it's another opportunity for him to kind of fit in with the other men at the colony. Like I said, the more and more we go through the film, the more he seems to be finding his place. Uh, I'm just, just surprised that Karen's so against them going hunting. And then he says, it's a good bonding moment. And she just goes, okay, and leaves. Yeah. Especially if they were like, we're just going to go hunt the animals that are killing things that she's afraid of. Yeah. That she, just the night before, went into the forest with Donna, a gun, and a flashlight. What were you anticipating doing with that gun? Yeah, exactly. Anyway. Also, during this little hunting excursion, we get music that's way too cartoonish and upbeat for what's going on. I think I pointed it when we were watching this, the circus music. Yeah, the music in this is a little weird, that's for sure. Later in a group session, Karen recounts what she remembers of the uh, meeting with Eddie. They all urge her to remember everything she saw, leading her to have a panic attack, and Dr. Wagner calling a quick stop to the talk. Yeah, good therapy tactic. Let's flood her until she panics. Yeah, Wagner's an interesting character that... Seems to have a lot of story that just isn't explored with the plot of this movie. Yeah. Like, I want to see the beginning of the colony. 
I want to see him discovering what's going on and trying to figure out what the best course of action is. Give me a Wagner movie. Anyway, Bill shoots a rabbit and is impressed that he killed it in one shot. Although I thought they were wolf hunting. Consistency. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like his excitement for doing this and his uh, um, being impressed with his ability. Uh, it goes along with what I was saying. He's slowly finding himself an accepting community. And accepting himself for being such an asshole. Chris and Terry are in a bookstore looking for books on the occult, monsters, and people that are into stealing corpses. And Sandra, who runs this store? I don't know. Some amazing actor that doesn't belong in this movie. That's right. Dick Miller. It's I love the working relationship that Dick Miller had with Joe Dante. Uh, because more often than not, you know, if you watch a Joe Dante film, you're going to see Dick Miller. And he's always a highlight. I can't think of a single time I've ever seen Dick Miller and was disappointed. Exactly. Uh, we also get a cameo from Forrest J. Ackerman, carrying copies of his magazine, Famous Monsters. Uh, looking at the IMDb, I discovered this. Also, like, Mick Garris, the director, has a cameo in this that I missed somewhere. And there are actually a bunch more uh, by prominent people. Uh, that worked behind the scenes in Hollywood at the time. So it's kind of kind of cool, like a, a group effort, a group acknowledgement of uh, Joe Dante's work. I mean, if you knew movies as well as I did, you would have caught them. I know, and All I'm really embarrassed by that. Yeah, yeah. I was hoping you wouldn't call me out on it, and now I just feel like shit. Well, I mean, it's okay, man, because you're still beautiful. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I promise you I'll work harder on watching movies. <laughs> Dick Miller gives Chris and Terry a breakdown of possible. werewolves uh, to kill them. Uh, the only way is to kill a werewolf, uh, silver bullets, or fire. Fire is a new one for me. I didn't know that one. That makes sense why the crazy old kook wanted to throw himself into the fire. Yeah, of course. And I get that for sure. But that's why I really like werewolves is because the only way to kill them is with silver bullets, which are incredibly difficult to get a hold of. Anybody can just start a fire and it just kind of lessens the menace of a werewolf to me. But whatever. Everybody can have their own original take on a fictitious creature. There you go. Bill confronts TC and asks what to do with the rabbit he killed. TC says that his sister can cook it up for him because not eating something you kill is a sin. Wait a minute. Does that mean that Eddie is eating the people that he's been killing in the city? I mean, it's very possible he's a werewolf. That's disturbing. A hesitant Bill agrees and heads over to Marsha's cabin. Oh, Which sorry, is a stupid spoiler. move, Bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From this point on, we, we just... It's fine that we know that we're supposed to dislike Bill, right? I thought we were supposed like, to dislike him from the start. I don't think so from the start. I just think as we go through the film, we are supposed to dislike him more and more until the point where we're just like, fuck that guy. I mean, he got mad. He, he got mad at Karen when... Yep. She wouldn't put out after a traumatic experience. I don't think that paints him in a good light from the start. No, I know. But he's already encountered Marsha on the beach. Knows exactly what she wants. Goes to talk to her brother about what to do. The brother says, go see my sister. And he's like, yeah. Yeah, I think I will. But, uh, okay. Once inside... Marsha cleans the rabbit and throws Bill the tail before she kisses him, biting his lip in the process. Bill quickly leaves and heads back to Karen, but is attacked by a beast on the way. It bites his arm and darts back into the darkness. Bill stumbles to his cabin and is rushed to Wagner, who gives him a shot to fight any potential infection. So Wagner knows what's going on at this point, and I'm assuming that shot is just for appearance? Placebo, I mean... if you will? It's definitely for appearance. It could just, I mean, it could be a legit, like, antibiotic, but knowing that that's not going to help. <laughs> like you a, imagine me, like, uh, pretty sure TC's been some weird places, so you might want this injection. Yeah, well, I mean, he got attacked by an animal, so you're like, maybe he's giving you, like, something for, like, a rabies shot, right? Or even still, it could just be something to help with the pain, right? Like, he knows, all right, transforming, getting bit, doesn't feel good. I just give him this little bit of, you know, medication, he'll feel a little better and think it's doing something. You just gave me an awesome idea for a film. I don't think I've ever seen a werewolf movie where 
the werewolf was rabid. So can you imagine a community of werewolves where they're aware of what's going on, they can control it, but one guy gets rabies and just goes mad? That would be fantastic. Seems like a bit much. A bit much. We're talking about werewolves. Yeah. All right, whatever. Chris and Terry are watching the Wolfman when they get a call from Karen telling them about Bill's attack. They pack their gear and Terry heads to the colony with Chris heading up the next day. Not even subtle that like every TV here plays a news story related to one of the characters or something werewolf related. Yeah, well, I mean, we get a close up of the TV in the movie telling us that anyone bit by the wolf will become one themselves. Yeah. Yeah, we fucking know. When has that never been the case? At the colony, Terry has met up with Bill and Karen. She apologizes for only bringing meat for dinner, but Bill is happily chowing down, saying that if he gets hungry enough, he'll eat anything. I don't know if I believe that. Karen tries to put the moves on Bill that night, but he shoots her down. Karen, frustrated that they're out of sync lately, rolls over and goes to sleep, mirroring the previous encounter. Well, I mean, he did just get attacked by an animal and get a shot. Read the room, Karen. Like I said, it mirrors it fine. Yeah. But at this time, we're still sympathizing with Karen in both uh, scenarios. Maybe you are. Oh, I see how it is. Well, surprise, surprise, she has more nightmares. But this time, the dreams include Bill. She wakes up to see that he's no longer in bed. He's wandered out into the woods and has some creepy sex with Marsha, during which the two turn into werewolves. Which is an opportunity for the obligatory 80s horror movie nudity. And for some reason animated silhouettes of werewolves. This was not done well, in my opinion. It should not have been done at all. No, it, it was unnecessary. awful. Just to throw it in there, too. You don't need it. Like, cut away. Cut away and have the howls. Yeah. You don't need animated silhouettes arcing their, like, arching their back, howling to the sky. Just cut to the trees. We know what's we happening. Howls. Exactly. <laughs> you don't need that. Terry is awakened by the loud howls emanating from the forest and decides to record them onto a cassette. <laughs> and this one, I like Wagner also hears the howls from his office and is looking rather nonplussed about what's happening in the woods. The look in his face is like, ah, damn it. Not again. <laughs> Knock it off. You crazy kids. <laughs> <laughs> You're animals. <laughs> Cut to the beach where Terry's reviewing her recording from the previous night making notes, and analyzing Eddie's artwork. Bill returns home to a sleeping Karen, seemingly ashamed of what he did. Is there... Is this character development? or I I don't know. We can't feel bad for Bill at this point. Well, I'm, just just, gonna, I'm just going to tell you right now, I didn't feel bad for Bill at any point I don't feel bad movie. for Bill either. Okay. But, like, get rid of this scene. We don't need to see that he's ashamed, because he doesn't do anything about it. He's already a shit character. He just gets more angry at Karen. Yeah. Terry climbs a trail and realizes the seascape she's looking at is the exact same one from the drawing she discovered in Eddie's apartment. Because of course it is. I know, that's what seven-year-old me said. Fade to the forest. Terry is making a beeline to Karen, but stops when she hears her name being whispered through the trees. She changes course and ends up at a cabin far off from the rest of the colony. She enters and sees the walls adorned, or walls and eaves adorned with makeshift bone mobi mobiles, and quickly discovers that this seemingly abandoned cabin is actually the residence of Eddie Quist. Who knows her name? Yeah. How would they know her name? She's the random journalist working with Chris. No idea. All right. But fine. Unless they were spying on her and Karen before. Which I, is, is possible. I don't you're, know. You're stretching, man. You're stretching. Vicious pounding begins on one of the doors, followed by an animalistic growl. I'm pretty sure the, the vicious beast... pounding took place in the forest the night before. Oh! <laughs> before the beast can break in, Terry dives out a window and arms herself with a hatchet. A werewolf's arm breaks through the wall and grabs her, but the quick-thinking journalist starts hacking at the appendage, severing it, and causing the beast to scream and flee. In a state of complete terror, she watches as the convulsing limb slowly transforms into that of a human being. So was that supposed to be Eddie? I think it was TC. Okay, see, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't think Eddie's back at this point. She yeah. flees the area and arrives at Wagner's office cabin. She grabs the phone and calls Chris. Karen wakes from another nightmare and quickly calls out Bill for new scratches on his back. He says he's being he says she's being paranoid and backhands her across the face. Karen gathers her things and flees. Leave that right there. Yeah. yeah. On the phone, Terry tells Chris everything she's discovered. She looks in a filing cabinet to find files on Eddie, and in doing so discovers that most people at the colony share the same surname of Quist. It's a, it's a good thing that Chris was also watching a werewolf cartoon at this point. Yes. Classic, classic style of animation that we see in, what, Cuphead? Yeah. She's immediately attacked by a werewolf who throws her around the office, manages to blind the creature with a light, but this is only temporary. Chris calls Sam, who assures him that Terry is safe. This is far from the case, as the wolf has lifted Terry several feet off the floor and is choking the life out of her. So this is a good 50 minutes into the movie, and we're finally seeing more of a werewolf at this point. Yes. Took long enough. I love the werewolf designs in this movie, except for those fucking ears. Those ears are way too big and make everything else look a little funny. Chris goes back to Dick Miller and steals the silver bullets he saw at the store earlier. I mean, he technically doesn't steal them because he just tosses a random amount of money. Uh, I guess he does pay for them, whether or not it's the actual amount. Yes. Who knows? Yes, because Dick Miller even says, like, I have to find out how much they're worth, but at least he got something. Yeah. He got something. <laughs> it's like five bucks. I, I'd hope 20. that it's a little bit more than that, but we'll see. Karen arrives at Wagner's office and finds Terry's body, her throat torn open. She tries the phone, which is now dead, and slowly backs toward a corner when she hears growling outside. Before she can hide, a sheet-covered body rises from the examination table, and we finally see the monster that is Eddie Quist. And then we get probably one of our least favorite scenes. I mean, it looks cool at first, and then just drags on. Uh, it's a transformation sequence of Eddie going full werewolf. And uh, it's just under three minutes long. Yeah, and like, I won't say it's like my least favorite scene or anything like that, because I do enjoy it for the most part on how it looks and how it's done. It just really is way too long. Yeah, they they show us like the twitchy eyebrows, which look kind of funny. Um, and I mean, definitely that took away from the desired impact of the scene, in my opinion. Uh, definitely the best werewolf hands I've ever seen in a movie, though. But they keep cutting back and forth to things we've already seen, so they just kind of lose their impact. And three minutes for this is way too long. Yeah. But Karen does the smartest thing possible and throws acid in Eddie's face and runs away. Uh, oddly accessible acid, though. Uh, a hurried Chris needs to gas up and stops at a petrol station, but is blocked by a guy who chastises him for being rich enough to buy a Mazda. Which I'm still confused about. Were those expensive in 1981? Was that considered a high-end car? I don't know about cars today, let alone 1981, man. Fair enough. Karen tries to speed off in her car, but is stopped by... Uh, why do I have Jetty written down here? Who the fuck's Jetty? I don't know. <laughs> I've reviewed these notes like four times. I have never seen Jetty. Anyway, and Charlie. They hold her at gunpoint and lead her to a barn where they're greeted by everybody from the colony. Terry's mutilated body has been laid upon a workbench for all to see. Wagner arrives, and Karen's immediate sense of safety uh, is quashed by the doctor's admit, admitted allegiance to his patients. Why Most of the colony... Think... Sorry, go ahead. Why I, she... I, I... Yeah, why? Why would she think that he's going to be helping her? Even before he does anything... The way that he just casually strolls in there, you gotta be like, well, oh, he's not here to save me. Yeah, just walk in. What's going on, kids? No, it definitely, like, the way he's carrying himself, there is no safety here. There's no reprieve from what's going on. Most of the colony tries to convince Karen about how exquisite lycanthropy can be, but there are still some members who refute this new method of recruitment. The doctor pleads the necessity of new ways of existence. Living with humans is his plan, but Marsha quickly takes charge, preferring to stick to the old ways where humans were just prey. And, like, they didn't foreshadow the tension between their 
views on this colony earlier when she got mad at him for giving her brother a book. Yeah. Yeah, we knew it was happening from the very beginning there. This movie doesn't um, hide anything well. No, it really doesn't. Uh, the doctor brings up a good point that uh, Karen is too famous to just disappear, uh, but the colony revolts, and Earl tells him that they can't be tamed. Chris has made it to the colony now, and in Wagner's office he finds Terry's tape recorder. He too is then confronted by Eddie, whose face is now severely deformed from his acid bath. During their confrontation, the recorder plays the horrible audio of Terry's death. Eddie transforms again, but before he can fully turn, Chris shoots him in the neck with his newly acquired silver bullets. Good thing. Why the neck? <laughs> that's he's not trained in firearms. I, it's what he hit. I guess. I guess. Charlie tells the colony to put Karen in a car, set it on fire, and push it over a cliff. But Chris arrives and kills several of the transforming patients, as well as Wagner, who thanks God before dying. Chris backs them all into the barn and locks the door. He and Karen pour gas all over the area and set it alight. The wolves punch holes through the wall in a desperate attempt to escape, but succumb to the fire. The remaining humans jump into Chris's car, killing another wolf as they drive off. They're stopped by Sam, who's blocked the road, and opens fire on them with his rifle. They manage to take him out, but the car stalls and is besieged by more werewolves. There's already more werewolves than there were characters we've seen in this movie. Yep. I always found that weird. And I don't know if that's poor writing or we're just led to believe that we only saw a small portion of the colony, but they kind of drove home the point that everybody we saw were the only residents. They absolutely do. I mean, you didn't even have random background characters in the barbecue hoedown scene. No, you didn't. You are introduced to almost all of them. All you needed to do was get a few extras to stand in the background. Yep. No, you're right. 100% right. Um, they fight them off, but a wolf makes it into the car and bites Karen's shoulder. She shoots it with the rifle, and as it transforms back to human form, we see that it was Bill. Karen tells Chris that they have to tell the world. They have to make them believe. So we cut to the TV station. Karen is being prepped to go back on camera, where she goes off script, contradicting Wagner's statement at the beginning of the film. She then begins to transform into a werewolf form, live on television, dumbfounding the viewers, before Chris shoots her, killing her, live on television. We quickly move to a CD bar where we discover that Marsha has survived the massacre and is still on the hunt and roll credits. We did not need that ending scene. What we did need was a better looking werewolf Karen, because she looked like a cat. Yeah, it was a, po a poorly done fake cat. Yeah, it was bad. It was really, it was bad. really bad. Yeah, really, supposed... really bad. It's supposed to be one of the most impactful parts of the movie, and it looked awful. Not to mention that, like, earlier in the movie, gender had no, like, had no impact on what they looked like when they transformed. They all looked the exact same. Yep. So why change it now? There has to be an explanation for that somewhere that we're missing. I'm yeah, assuming that actually may, have, may maybe the explanation is budget cuts at the last minute. I don't know. But they would have had to make a new costume for that. Yeah, you're right. It's just I don't know. It's a major letdown to end on that. Like if it was we, a budget thing, you didn't even need to make Karen a costume. You cut away, and then when you cut back to her fully transformed, it could just be one of the other ones in the costume because they all look the same. Yeah, and I really did like. The uh, the reflecting eyes and like the green eyes and uh, the fangs as she was starting to transform. I thought that looked good. The howl that she unleashed was amazing. Um, I did like <laughs> I did like the cut to the kids watching TV and just the mother in the kitchen being like, "What are you two watching?" <laughs> the TV lady's turning into a werewolf. Just like everybody's reaction watching TV from home or in a bar. But we needed a better Karen werewolf costume, and we did not need the Marsha scene. Well, maybe they thought that uh, it would be a great setup for the sequel. It definitely was not that. I, I mean, you're, you're, you're probably right. That's what they were going for. But it was not a great setup. No, I didn't like it. Yeah, I don't know. I normally really, really like Joe Dante movies. Um, I mean, we well, you haven't, but I like Piranha. 
I liked Inner Space. Gremlins was great. We both had a good time talking about the Burbs. Um, there are elements of this movie I thought are a lot of fun, but what, like, what do you think? How did you feel after watching this? So we're going to get into that right now, huh? No, I just want like a brief recap of your feelings of the whole. Then we'll go into recommendations, obviously, later. Um, it's slow, man. Yeah. Like... It, it definitely was that. I mentioned it. It took 50 minutes to see a werewolf, and I get that there was some teases and things like that. But it, it really felt slow for that first 50, 55 minutes. And then the ending just flew by. And not in the sense that, like, it was so... Like entertaining that I lost track of time. Like no, like it. They cut a lot of corners and they fast forwarded the ending very quickly. Yeah. Um, at the time, um, delaying reveals in horror movies was kind of the big thing. Um, that happened in '75 with Jaws. You didn't see the shark really until the end, but that's because the shark they had, the mechanical shark, kept breaking, so they could never really have it on camera. And it just worked to their advantage. But it worked so well that other movies started copying that formula. Uh, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I, I don't think it really worked in this movie. I mean, even if you don't see the werewolf that early, like, you got to see some of its effects beyond, oh, it destroyed a cow or it howled in the forest. Like, give me some early victims or something. Like... They don't seem like much of a threat for a big part of the movie. Yeah, they don't at all. Which is, I guess, like Wagner's plan. I mean, that's what he wanted everyone to live in harmony. But I don't know. It just, it was definitely missing. It was definitely lacking in this film. They needed some early reveals. I agree. Something. So when I said budget cuts, what what do you think? the budget of this movie was one million yep really estimated one million dollars yeah okay so yeah and even in 1981 that doesn't seem super high i for a million it it looked good i would say for the most part then they throw in like a cartoon silhouette of werewolves for some reason yeah budget on that shit but also explains the location where a lot of it takes place outside of the city so no real filming permits necessary um any idea or a rough estimation of how much it made or grossed i should say i can't even begin to think uh yeah it's a it's a difficult one to guess seven million 17 million Ooh, that is a lot higher than anything i would have guessed yeah, well, keep in mind too, like w- the heyday of werewolf movies, like these, like this year started the the kick again about the uh, the werewolf genre. Well, I mean, let's let's be fair. Even in like in 1981, even if my guess was accurate, seven million would not have been considered a failure by any means. No, not at all. But I'm... also, this is probably one of the better werewolf movies that we got up until this point. Like when it, like when comparing it to anything else, it probably leaps and bounds ahead of most other films. It wasn't exactly a, a big genre. So, yeah. I mean, there's probably uh, people probably thought it was great when it came out. Care to uh guess on uh, ratings? I think they're a little bit more along the lines of how I feel about the movie and less so how you feel about it. I'm going to say that since a lot of the reviews on the internet are more recent, people like their throwback stuff, Mm -hmm. six, seven out of ten. Six point six out of ten. Oh, you are correct. Well, I mean, I gave a range. I kind of cheated. (laughs) Right. Well, it's almost almost exactly in the middle of that range. I might as well be a weatherman. Ah, it's a 40 (laughs) percent chance. Yeah. Um, one thing that surprised me uh, was uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, the critics gave it a 72 and the audience gave it a 58. Oof. Yeah. And uh, I guess I'll just kind of go into the awards here because 
when we were watching this, you were dead on, this is worse performance. And I defended why it wasn't. Um, but for worse performance, I had to agree with you. After watching it again, reviewing notes, looking at how much screen time people had and what we got from them during that screen time, undeniably the worst performance in this movie is D. Wallace, right? Not even a question. I don't think that... Uh, I don't think I could even entertain an argument from someone else that another actor w- would get worse performance. <laughs> I was, I was de- trying to defend her this entire film, and then I thought about other roles I'd seen her in, and I was just like, you know, in comparison, she's, she's terrible with this role. Well, that was the big thing. We're talking about it. And you're telling yeah. me, like, she was in this, she was in this. And I'm like, how? Yeah, how? yeah we're watching The Howling. <laughs> how could she, like, how could she do The Howling, still get big offers, and then knock those ones out of the park? It just doesn't make sense. I don't know. Maybe going from Joe Dante this year to Steven Spielberg the next year? It's There's so much overacting. There's yeah. way too Underacting. Much- there's way too much <laughs> underacting. I feel like emotions are just not even there for the most part. Uh, like I really can't say much more. If you've seen this movie, you should see what I'm talking about. Uh, what about uh, best performance? Uh, so honorable mention to Dick Miller. Always. But I can't, because of screen time, pick him. Although, uh, if he got a couple more scenes, I would have stretched it. Uh, I'm going to go with Patrick McKee, uh, McNee. Okay. McNee as Dr. George Wagner. Um, I think I'm going to pick him primarily because he was the least offensive to me. Okay. Interesting. I mean, definitely a strong performance for sure. I mean, he's a character that they didn't rely too much on, right? He didn't really yeah. need to do like a a wide range of different emotions. He didn't have to really carry too many scenes. Uh, The closest would be maybe the first scene when he's on the television station, which is very informative, but he does come off as distinguished, intelligent, well-spoken. And throughout the movie, I think it's just the most consistent performance, which prevents it from, you know, right. Like everybody else being disqualified due to some, drastic valleys in their performances yeah and i think choosing to start off the movie with wagner who i believe he's the very first person we see during the the tv interview Mm -hmm. uh is a very smart move because he is a strong actor and you start off your film with that you know it's just it makes sense i disagree that he's best performance though that's fair Um, as long as you can see where i'm coming from from it Oh, okay. oh, a great pick, for sure. I totally understand why you did it. But I'm going to have to go with Robert Picardo as Eddie. Uh, I thought every time he was on screen, he was gripping, uh, demanded my attention the entire time, um, played with his voice a lot, um, played with emotion a lot. And while you couldn't see a lot of his face all of the time, you could see his body movement all of the time. And he was moving in awkward ways uh, that were physically intimidating. Um, I thought he did a great job. And I also kind of find it fun. I find it kind of funny that my best performance and honorable mention for best performance were the garbage men from the birds. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to argue that his performance wasn't good, but my argument and one of the biggest reasons that I didn't consider him is because he had almost the same amount of screen time as his garbage man partner from the Burbs. Not true. Think about it. He's voices at the beginning with the telephone. Then you see little bits of him in the, in the porno booth. You do not see him again for like 50 minutes during all of this slow buildup until Terry goes to the cottage. And even then you don't see him until the end. You see a transformation scene. You see him come out with acid. If you go back and actually time his screen time, it's pretty low. But you still see more acting range than uh, Macney. I didn't because say you... I didn't say he wasn't great. He was. I'm saying that he didn't get that much screen time. 
And that's what made it hard for me to consider him because really he's pretty much in three scenes. Okay. But if we take screen time away and remove Dick Miller from the movie, would you say that Patrick McNee did a better job at acting than Robert Picardo? No, but th- that's okay, the big that's, thing. That's all, that's all I was curious about. And, and that's why I said, I, I literally prefixed it by saying, I'm not going to argue that he didn't have like a great performance. Yeah. My difficulty with selecting him is because he had barely more screen time than our honorable mention. Okay. Well, I'll, I will change it then. If, if that's where no, we're going, you don't have I'm going to... Gonna, it, <laughs> My pick is Dennis Dugan as Chris. <laughs> you don't have to change it. I was just trying to play off of it and let you know my thoughts on it. You're perfectly able to pick it. And that's why I selected Dennis Dugan. So, right, did you really? What? Did, did you yes. do that whole thing? To yes, of course I did. It's Dennis Dugan. He's the best actor in this movie. Oh, I hate you so much. <laughs> I knew you were going to call me out on that. We've talked about that numerous times in other films. I hate you. (laughs) Such a jerk. Dennis Dugan was great in this movie. Uh, We're introduced to him as Chris, and he's not an imposing character. You think he's just a throwaway. But then he comes back time and time again with more emotion and more screen time. He interacts with all of the characters, and he does so in a great way. Like, it just is a flippantly way, like you said, he throws money at... uh, at Dick Miller when he gets the bullets, uh, the way he his character interacts with Terry, uh, the caring that he shows Karen. Um, he even, like, you can see he questions Bill's character at times just through a look. Like, it's great. He's not a main character, but as a secondary character, he shares a lot of screen time. He has a presence to him all of the time, even when it's just him on a phone looking at cartoons. He's emoting incredibly well. He speaks very well. He's the best actor in this movie for sure well i can't argue with that because he was the one that i was debating between him and patrick mcnee for my choice so oh yeah 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 i both strong choices in my opinion all right you jerk i can't believe you fell for that what was your most memorable or favorite line uh walter our bookstore clerk dick miller okay yeah, we get them all. Sun worshippers, moon worshippers, Satanists. The Manson family used to hang around and shoplift. Bunch of deadbeats. <laughs> Nothing to do with the plot whatsoever, but that always stood out to me. Um, the, the only reason that I wouldn't have picked a line like that is because then I would have had to pick everything he said. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, just... his lines are great. You just want you just want to hear everything he has to say. Um, yep. For my, and this wasn't my favorite line. Uh, it's my most memorable line, and it's pretty negative in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But it's also, as we were discussing earlier, very emblematic of the time that the movie came out. Um, the lack of knowledge, weight, or understanding that people put into mental health at that time. And mm-hmm. it's when uh, the, I don't know if he's the video producer at the news station or if he's just the manager or something, but uh, Kevin McCarthy, Fred, uh, puts Karen back on TV before she's ready. And when she's having her little near panic attack, he says, who knows, maybe she's pregnant. Yeah. And like. Yeah, it's pretty fucked up. I was so disappointed, and I get, I can't put myself in the mentality. I mean, this movie was made before I was born. Don't know what the world was like back then. But watching it today, I, I'm i not going to forget that line just because it's like, oh, come on, man. Like, you are very well the cause of this. You probably are the one that set this up with the police to have her do this thing. You're the one who pushed her back on camera way too early and then you just flippantly wave it off call for another news anchor and you just state the reasoning as maybe she's pregnant not the fact that she was involved in this police shooting werewolf attack sting but maybe she's pregnant yeah it's pretty deplorable 
So that means I really said, don't, know, don't know what else to say. Let's go to my most memorable slash favorite moment, which is absolutely my favorite moment. Okay. And it was the first scene with Dick Miller at the bookstore. The whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. He's great. He, I mean, he honestly, I said this to you when we were watching it. It's almost a disservice to have him in the movie because his greatness just makes everybody look that much worse. Um, yeah, yeah, it definitely pokes holes in some of the performances, except for Dugan. The delivery is fantastic. He provides a lot of information, bridging the gap between what in the movie world is fiction, because he's got all the werewolf books, but it's not actually fiction in that world, as we later learn, obviously. Um, and he just he just has like a presence on the screen. Well, I think he's probably the most professional performer on or in the film. Um, I, I could he's been watched. around long enough that he knows what to do. He knows what beats to hit. Like he's just, he was, he was one of the best actors ever. I, I could watch an entire movie of just that bookstore owner. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Um, even if it's just like a spinoff short film, I know they didn't really do stuff like that back then, but, uh, um, no, it would be good. It would be good to see Dick Miller as uh, as Walter for a little bit longer. Yep. Um, I agree with you that that would be my favorite scene. Um, but my most memorable scene is the porn booth, um, just because of how uncomfortable it made me feel. Uh, I remember that. Keep in mind, like I saw this when I was seven, and it fucked me up for a long time. And uh, every time I think of the howling, like I do enjoy the film, but that's the first scene that jumps out to me. Okay, I mean, you really can't argue that. Yeah, it's definitely the most uncomfortable moment in this film. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, that was our awards. Uh, I almost hate to ask, but um, what's your final recommendation on this one? Um. I'm kind of torn. Uh, I really do enjoy the movie, but I don't know if it's because the movie is good or if it's probably just one of the best werewolf movies we've gotten so far. So, okay, yeah. Okay, that works. That works perfectly. Um, would I recommend this movie to anybody? No. No, it's very slow. It, it doesn't offer like thrills and chills like a lot of horror movies tend to do um but if you want to watch a solid werewolf movie 100 percent check out the howling um it's one of the better ones out there but it's definitely for a niche audience so for anybody listening to this that doesn't love werewolf movies uh don't bother i mean it's got a great cast it's got a great director some relatively strong writing but it is a werewolf movie for werewolf fans. And if that's not what you're looking for, don't do it. Hmm. You? I think you're being generous. I don't recommend anybody watch this movie. Uh, I get that there was a time and an era where this might have been a little bit more um, accepted, enjoyable, university acclaimed. But we're talking 40 years ago, man. And in my opinion, it didn't age at all. Uh, there's way too much slow buildup in... A... You, you mean it, it, it aged poorly? What did I say? It didn't age at all. Oh, I, I meant to say it didn't <laughs> age well at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, there's... I mean, in the last 40 years, there's been so many better werewolf movies released that I don't see why you would spend your time watching this. Uh, the first hour barely feels like a werewolf movie. It feels more like a like a drama with werewolves. Um, I got nothing, man. I can't articulate it. It's it's a I, pass. It's a hard I, pass. I have to ask though, and this is going to put you on the spot. Of course it is. You said in the 40 years since this movie came out, there have been much better werewolf movies? Yeah. Like what? 
Uh, while we reviewed Late Phases. Late Phases is great. The werewolves look like trash, but it's a really good movie, yeah? You know what, though? I would take a much more enjoyable movie over a movie with better special effects. Um, like, yes, these wolves looked good, minus Karen's final... Yeah. Um, Werecat. <laughs> It's you're so act. It's not even. It's not even a werewolf. It's a werecat. But yeah. I mean, there's got to be better. It's just so much better. I mean, I throw. It's on, hard to do a good werewolf movie, man. I'm not saying it's not hard to do, but like, okay, obviously very different tone. But I would sooner watch Teen Wolf than this any day. And you, week. you almost did. I almost picked Teen Wolf over this. Why didn't you? That would have been because so much better. better. This is better. I mean, we also revert, reviewed Cursed, which I didn't enjoy. And I would still sooner watch that one than this. No way in hell. Totally would. I think the only werewolf movie out there that is better than this all around is Dog Soldiers. I'm surprised you wouldn't say something like Silver Bullet. Just do your I mean, I, I, we know I love Corey Haim, and I definitely love Gary Busey and Terry O'Quinn. But that is the worst fucking werewolf I have ever seen in my life. Yeah, but I mean, I, I flat out said because of your biases. No, I, I'm, I, I'd still put Silver Bullet below the Howling. <sighs> that's how. That's harsh. <laughs> I don't know. I like this movie does hold a special place in my heart, and maybe it's because I was traumatized when I saw it so young. It just kind of stuck with me. But um, yeah, it's it's a strong werewolf movie in my opinion. I'm like, yeah, it definitely has its weaknesses. So obviously there is a bias here towards that film. Um, but I don't think there's a lot out there better than this, more competent than this. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I'll find one. We'll cover it. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I'm sure as soon as we finish recording, you'll have a, oh, I forgot about that one movie moment. Oh, probably. Um, all right. Well, that being said, if anybody has any thoughts, opinions, want to chime in on our argument about the quality of this movie, you can hit us up on social media. We are on Twitter at BS Bargain Bin. You can find us on Facebook, although Facebook's not really that active anymore these days. Um, or you can even email us, uh, BS Bargain Bin at Outlook.com. Uh, we've already alluded to it. Next week, we are doing our October fan pick. So would you like to remind the audience what that was? Yeah. So next week, we'll be covering the 1991 classic, Ernest Scared Stupid. From Touchstone Pictures, monstrous trolls have sprung to life. That's your hope you're from Keebler. And now, Ernest P. Worrell is springing into action. He'll try anything. I know Tai Chi Kung Fu Chow Man. And everything. Your shoes untie. To save the day. It's showtime. Yeah. It's Ernest P. Worrell in a brand new movie. Oh. Ernest Scared Stupid. How about a bumper sandwich, booger lips? You know what I mean? Starts Friday, October 11th at a theater near you. All right. Thank you, Craig, for that pick. We will see you guys next week. Until then, have a good one, guys. All the best, guys.